So we're back at the vision stage here at Green Tech, and the next session is called Solving Global Challenges Together. And together with me here is Annette Weyering from the Netherlands, the Dutch Enterprise Agency. Annette, warm greetings to you. Matt, Matt Gosnell, come all the way from the States to be with us uh, from App Harvest. And we have on the line with us as well, uh, calling in from uh, the Gulf is Sky Kurtz from uh, Pure Harvest Smart Farm. Sky, hello to you. And to my right hello. here. Hi, Sky. How are you? Good, good. Good morning to you. Are you excited? Did you see some of our uh, energy in the opening session already? Certainly. And also my uh, colleague and our head grower, Jan Prinz, is present on the ground. So I'm, uh, I'm getting feedback from him as well. It sounds like a great event. I wish I could have joined you. Well, we'll see you again soon, but it's great to have the connection as well in this way, and that will be part of our rich conversation, which is also joined by Dirk Aleven from Food Ventures. Dirk, it's great to see you here again. And yeah, we're uh, co-creating a sustainable future. That was the message as well from our opening session, if you like. And uh, not only the Netherlands Enterprise Agency uh, here at the table, if you like, as a catalyst, but we have three regional examples and representatives from different regions. We'd like to bring in what that really means, not only in a global context, but also between different regions. So uh, we're going to start, actually, Annette, if we could, for you to set the tone and give us a bit of context um, about what you're doing at the Enterprise Agency. And we have a small video to introduce it quickly. So action. Annette, it's wonderful to put some pictures to the words that we're talking about here and see a lot of those examples of what's going on. So you have a, a small presentation to give, and you're going to give us a few words about the work of the Netherlands Enterprise Agency in regard to horticulture around the world. Yes, thank you. Uh, the film is one of the things we do, putting Dutch entrepreneurs in the spotlight everywhere. And it always makes me proud to see how many Dutch entrepreneurs are there that have very sustainable and innovation solutions to bring to the societal challenges, to bring them all over the world. 
And actually, we can see that we are all over the world because we are very strong in every region, everywhere. And I think uh, we are in an excellent position to elaborate on that. Uh, we are not, uh, we are the second world exporter on that. And when you look to last year, we also had a growth in 20% of greenhouse technology sales all over the world. So it's actually quite impressive. But I would like to stress that um, the world is changing. Like Edith Schippers already said, uh, we have to look for societal challenges. They are becoming more and more uh, on the front of your table, also as an entrepreneur. And that means that you are not only can sell your product, but you have to think in food systems as a whole to integrate in that and also to look in your position in a total value chain. And those global challenges you can't solve alone. You have to partnership. You have to co-create. And we see also that your customers are asking more and more for that, for this co-creation, to do it together, and also to find real solutions for the local situations. Uh, so adapt your product, innovate it over there. And I think the third thing you see is also that the position of governments are changing. Uh, strategic autonomy, local production, um, uh, autonomy in food production is, is more and more on the table. But you can also see that your production in one part and your trading partners in one part of the globe are also affected by trade policies and the trade relations with governments on other sides of the globe. Um, strategic autonomy, but also protecting your knowledge and innovation are all things where also governments, not only as a buyer of your product, but also as a player in this, in this global field is very important. Well, it sounds incredibly complex and uh, getting even more complex. So I imagine as well, and we'll hear from, from Matt in a, in a moment, Navigating those waters, especially as a very innovative company, can not always be so easy. Is this where your agency comes into play? or? Yes, that's actually where our agency is coming into play. We are not only helping individual entrepreneurs uh, by positioning in markets, finding the right contacts, uh, providing with good market information or fairs like this or otherwise, but we are also working quite closely, public-private, together on multi-annual programs. Uh, in different regions of the world. And we are doing that with top sectors, with leading parties in horticulture, but also in other sectors, to positioning uh, you are as a company or as a cluster of companies in these regions. And you asked me to, to dive a little bit into the different Please do. Uh, regions. Please do, yeah. And actually, when you look at the Middle East, you see that uh, most of the economies are looking for a diversification. The dependency on oil and gas should be less, so they are looking to other uh, opportunities to find income. And they all have the same kind of challenges, uh, what we call the nexus, water, energy, and food. So it really demonstrates that it's not only horticulture itself, but you find to look across borders. So we are also supporting that with knowledge and information centers, uh, for example, in Jordan. But I think uh, what, what was just said, the Expo Dubai is one of the best examples of that. So we put a very uh, sustainable, innovative uh, pavilion there. And actually, this pavilion itself already demonstrates your case. So I would say- Walking the walk. Walking the walk, make use of it with partners like the BOM or Hogedorn or Copper. I can't name them all. But actually, you can use it to position yourself in these kind of markets. When we look to the Chinese market, you see that um, there are a lot of challenges in the environment, water, uh, and food uh, corners, so in between that. Uh, for example, 30 or 40 percent of food losses still. But also, we see we have sold a lot of greenhouses there, but it's not enough anymore. You have to train the people also. You have to inf invest in the right seed materials for that. You have to invest in your logistics in that transport. Because the whole value chain is making your case, and not only the product that you are selling there. So we really see that also customers ask you to cooperate between a cluster of partners with knowledge institutions in the Netherlands and entrepreneurs, 
but also with partners over there. Uh, and last but not least, of course, the United States. We see the uh, largest exporter in the world, of course, but we see that we also have a lot of challenges in common, and we have a lot of possibilities to cooperate and to share our knowledge and innovation. We have some large tracks with Pennsylvania, also in agriculture innovation uh, field. We have in the fruits, uh, we have with California and uh, Washington State, we have a long-term cooperation, also providing a lot of opportunities for clusters of companies who are working there. Also, our knowledge institutions are quite involved. And of course, one of the wonderful cases in which we cooperate also is in Kentucky on the Agrotech. But I won't go into that because you are doing that. But that's all also things that we are trying to stimulate to be a catalyst to support with fairs, missions, and all kinds of things that are necessary to position yourself. So actually, my call to action is uh, cooperate, look across borders, look to innovative and new kinds of partners, also in what we call the Golden Triangle. And as a Netherlands Enterprise Agency, also together with the top sector, we would like to support you in that. Fantastic appeal and a call to action. We'll come back to some of the points you made there in just a second. And uh, Dirk, we asked you, we're going to start with the, with the east and move to the west, if that's OK, uh, Matt. And um, Dirk, we asked you to really represent China, if you like, and some of the experiences you've made there. Of course, everyone here is global, but you have some very specific experience in China. I saw you locked up in some uh, quarantine hotels for some time on social media. So uh, I know you've been there quite a lot and, and doing some great work there already. Thanks for the support while being uh, <laughs> locked up in the in the rooms. Indeed, I think I spent uh, over the last year, twelve uh, um, uh, over the last twelve months, uh, about a month in quarantine in the, in the hotel room in uh, in China. Um, I have a presentation, so I hope we can get that. Uh, but uh, thanks for the opportunity of uh, introducing uh, Food Ventures and uh, and what we do. Um, I think what we've, uh, the, the call to action is basically all about the, the big challenge that we have of uh, producing more food uh, in the next 40 years than we've done over the last 8,000 years. So that's a tremendous um, challenge that we stand for. And I think it's my, uh, well, it's my humble opinion that the Dutch have an important role to play there uh, in, uh, in coming with solutions to, uh, to feed the world. Uh, obviously, we need to change our diet from uh, a meat-based diet to uh, at least hybrid or, or more plant-based uh, diets. And the way to produce that is uh, in greenhouses. Um, greenhouses allow us to reduce the number of, uh, of water per kilogram, uh, energy per kilogram. We bring our food closer to where it's consumed in the cities. Pesticides. Pesti well, we fertilizers. hardly use, we, we don't have to use any pesticides because we contain the environment. So we see that over the last decades, there's um, outside Europe a growing need for, uh, for glass houses. It's fantastic to see that uh, the, the industry is in the spotlights, I would say, uh, from China to Middle East and, and uh, the US indeed. Um, and that's something which took us generations to build uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, we, we come literally from the production under a glass and, and from grand grandparents uh, transferring the knowledge to the next generations where we improve from uh, low, uh, low glass greenhouses up to automated greenhouses and now to the super high tech greenhouses we're looking at uh, today. Um, having that, that generations doing so, um, we belong to the absolute top of growers in the Netherlands worldwide. There is, there is no uh, discussion about it that only the best growers are here based in, uh, in, in the Netherlands. Surviving in an environment which is very competitive because there's an, uh, there's an overproduction basically, that's why we're such a big exporter, means that only the very best growers survive in the Netherlands. So the ones that do grow in greenhouses in the Netherlands, they are focused on squeezing out that last little bit uh, from every square, uh, square meter. That's very different from developing greenhouses outside the Netherlands, uh, whereas there is a complete absence of um, the supply chain. Uh, there is no peers, first, uh, first of a kind greenhouses that, for instance, in, in, in Kentucky, what's, uh, what's going on. So it's a, it's a very different challenge. Um, and often uh, such a big challenge that it leads to failures as well in, uh, in new greenhouses. Um, 
what we see is uh, what we've done this uh, over the last uh, over the last 10 years in in several countries uh, starting up new greenhouses in completely new environments uh, and that basically means that you have to do everything yourself so you have to fill the gaps and find local supply chain and making sure that you uh, that you're able to ramp up that new greenhouses in in new environments uh, we have assessed uh, new projects uh, for investors and, and, and asset holders around the globe. And um, we do that in a different way. We have, uh, we're based in the Netherlands, but we're only working abroad. Um, so we're developing that greenhouses abroad. Uh, we do so by bringing in experts, um, so, so Dutch experts on the ground, uh, ramping up those first years of, uh, uh, of, of production. Uh, we have um, a set of procedures because we've done it already so often, and the tools to monitor, uh, monitor them on distance. And we take a, a P&L responsibility. So that's, uh, that's a completely different approach than, than coming in as a grower or as a, uh, as a consultant uh, only. Um, I hope that we can have the next slide. It seems to be stuck. Yep. So basically, if you look at the, all the new glee, uh, greenhouses that are being de uh, developed, uh, you see that there's typically two answers to that question of who's going to run it. It's either a one-man show, so there's a grower who's, who's invited to join that greenhouse, or it's consultants uh, who do not have any skin in the game. Uh, in our approach, we, we basically either co-invest into that greenhouse, so we have skin in the game, or we take a full responsibility uh, for the P&L on a lease term. Uh, I'll skip this one, but this is basically the, the two ways of doing it. So either leasing the greenhouse or, uh, or investing into it. And then coming to the two examples which you asked me uh, to give. Uh, this is the first one is a greenhouse that we developed from scratch. So we also constructed it, we tendered it, we built it, and we are growing now vegetables on the steps of Kazakhstan. The business case of Kazakhstan is very simple. Instead of importing it from Spain or Israel, um, we and, and, and flaring gas from the oil, because that's the two problems Kazakhstan is facing, we're using that flare gas, we're producing electricity and heat with it, and, and we're producing uh, um, uh, tomatoes nearby the markets where it's being consumed, substituting imports. And in China, um, the business case is um, quite different. There is enough production, but there is um, a lack of safe produce, and especially um, safe produce nearby the cities. So China is looking into localizing their productions using high-tech greenhouses um, and convincing that consumer that um, what he is eating is, the, uh, is, is safe, it's um, uh, uh, produced in a sustainable way, and it's traceable. So this greenhouse is uh, next to Shanghai, where we invite our customers to come over and consume it uh, or, or buy it where it's, where it's being produced. We had to develop um, the whole brand around it as well. So uh, Vitabyte has just uh, been launched as, as our produce, being a Dutch produce, but made in China, uh, producing sustainable um, vegetables in high-tech greenhouses nearby the city. What about the operation of those greenhouses? Because you mentioned, you know, the expertise, the knowledge. It's very organic. It's grown over generations. And there is a shortage, of course, in general uh, for human resources, but especially for that kind of expertise. How do you manage that then, especially far away? Yeah, that's, that's the, the, the big challenge that, well, we call it a, a food ventures family of growers. So it's, um, it's a group of, uh, of growers and experts that, that join us on the operations uh, locally, especially those first two, three years. They are very, very challenging. Um, you have to, you're, you're basically building a, a rocket launcher in the middle of nowhere and, uh, and you have to find your, your people to run it. So 90% I would say we source locally, but 10% of the, of the staff is, uh, is Food Ventures uh, staff, and they, they bring in the tools and um, uh, basically the, the, um, the back end in the Netherlands. So they have their support from the Netherlands. We have an expertise center in the Netherlands that's daily op um, uh, watching over the operations abroad, and we have boots on the ground. So we do not think that it's one or the other. It's a combination of having boots on the ground and the right tools and, uh, and, and people uh, um, uh, to do so. Fantastic. We're going to come into more of a discussion in a moment, but let's first go to the Middle East, if we can. Sky, you're joining us from the UAE. Tell us a bit about uh, your work, what you're doing in that region, and what the particular challenges are. Uh, well, 
great to join you guys. And I'm going to fly through a bit of material but to give you a bit of a perspective of how we see the world from the Middle East into Southeast Asia, where we're headed. Um, you know, a, a bit about me, I think some of those who know me, I, I used to be a technology investor and I became an entrepreneur and really just seeing the opportunity to use technology to improve people's lives. And I'm very excited to be part of Controlled Environment Ag and to be working so closely with Holland as I have over the many, uh, past many years. And at Pure Harvest, what we're doing is we're building a resilient food system, but for the world. And this is an image of our pilot facility, the one we built back in 2018, that has been operating for over three years continuously, even through the incredibly harsh summers of the UAE, which are extreme heat and extreme humidity. And it just shows the contrast with the desert in the background, and also with the incredible quality of the fresh produce that you can see here, right? It's, it's achieving BRICS levels and quality levels that are uh, even better than those coming out of Europe, out of markets like Holland and like the south of France and Aix en Provence. And with the way we see the problem, um, you know, why did we come to the Middle East? I'm asked often as opposed to starting in America where I'm from, I was actually raised in Arizona. And it was because I saw this, we all talk about how there's nine and a half billion people by 2050, we need 70% more food to feed those people, but nobody ever double clicks on where. It is not an equally distributed problem. America's a net exporter, as was mentioned earlier. Australia's a net exporter, China's a net exporter. But actually all these red and brown countries are 100% of that problem when you talk about food security. And of course, this is being made worse by climate change, right? So we thought that if we could develop a solution in one of the harshest environments in the world in kind of ground zero of the need, that then we could take that solution around the world to other markets facing a similar need. Uh, but we thought it would be more difficult to go the other way around. So that's really why. And I think this map for those who want to tackle and support food security needs, these are the markets that need it the most. Not to say the other markets aren't wonderful opportunities as well. And my contemporaries are, are in some of these markets. But I think uh, for, for kind of the the impact focus, uh, a lot of these markets really need food. And I think it, it was also mentioned the powerful trends that are supporting the focus on controlled environment ag coming to the world stage, but the need, you know, planet, uh, government shifts in focus on food security, water conservation, et cetera, industrial innovation, uh, uh, driving technological disruption in traditional agriculture, but also addressing the challenges there. And then last but not least, the consumer, who's starting to care about what they eat, where it comes from, and uh, focusing on local and focusing on community. And all any one of these trends, trends would be investable on its own, but these are all exist within controlled environment ag. And I think that's why it's such a powerful theme that's gathering such a world stage. And I think now, there's the more, East, sorry, Sky, just on that point quickly, I think there's more dynamic at the moment, especially people have seen the breakdowns in the supply chains uh, more recently, especially in those net import countries like the UAE for food. And that's caused a certain, uh, yeah, uh, anxiety in the, in, in the consumer. No, absolutely. Uh, I think well. the fragility of the fragility of the food system in its current form is, has been exposed, right? And, and COVID accelerated these thoughts. And then you have the added agendas of things like economic diversification, which our colleague mentioned earlier. Now, the Middle East is actually a microcosm of sort of the worst of the worst of all these threats, right? The import dependence, the incredibly harsh climate, the inefficiency of air freighting food here, and of course, a population health crisis. We have world, our obesity rates that are only paralleled in certain cities in America. And also you have local seasonal lower quality produce that's available part of the year from markets locally or from Iran or from Jordan. But then all year you have high cost air freighted imports from Holland or France or Spain, but you've really had nothing in between. And we saw an opportunity to create a new category, premium local, branded trusted product that's of Dutch quality, but at a much lower cost, partly arbitraging that transport, but also capitalizing on the factor endowments of producing here. And that's where I'm gonna to get to what I think people will find surprising. The contrarian thesis we had in, in building Pure Harvest Smart Farms was this. If you go down the green bar on the left of the chart I'm showing you, this is the cost structure of farming anywhere in the world. The fields of Botswana or high-tech greenhouses in, in um, Canada or Holland or vertical farms in Manhattan. Right? It is light, whether artificial or natural, labor, energy, CO2, water, uh, land or space, if you don't grow in the earth, and it's transportation, capital, and taxation. Right, These affect all. But if you benchmark the GCC, the Middle East, against Holland, the most efficient producer in the world, right? what we all built based on the model, we're, we have twice the light, a fraction of the labor cost, cheaper energy and getting cheaper with and more sustainable with 
powerful utility scale solar deployments and nukes turning on. Oh, you have CO2, we're the hydrocarbon capital of the world. Water, Holland wins, right? We're not as efficient in water, but we're seven to 10 times more efficient than incumbent ag. So a huge step in the right direction. And a lot of R&D is happening to improve water efficiency as well as capture and create water. Lots of land, transport, of course, not air freighting sacks of sugar water across the ocean, makes a lot of sense. And, um, and of course, there's a lot of capital and very low tax rates, right? So intuitively, this sort of explains why did we believe that if we could grow around the equator, we could actually be lower cost and democratize access to high quality, sustainably grown produce. This is what we built our business case on and why I left a promising Silicon Valley career to build tomatoes in the desert, right? Because I believed in a bigger vision. But we're standing on the shoulder of giants, right? Holland, the miracle of Holland and what, what has been accomplished in this small country, uh, uh, driving efficiency, developing innovative approaches to food production. Um, we're taking that and working to stamp that across the world in these markets that need it. However, we've had to make adaptations to the tools that Holland used, which were admittedly built focused on a very different climate environment than the climates we operate in, right? This is how we farm on the left side of this chart in the Middle East. You know, surprise why it's inefficient and low yielding. That is how Holland farms, right, on the, on the right, which is phenomenal. But as you see, I, I believe that we're really building upon this incredible foundation in partnership with Holland, which has been without a doubt the knowledge leader in this. And this shows what's possible. This is three years of climate data in our pilot, right? Outside temperatures hitting 50-51, and we are maintaining a perfect Mediterranean climate corridor. And believe it or not, you even have to heat in the winters in the Middle East. But this, if you can do this here in the heart of the UAE, which is one of the harshest environments on the planet, a desert subtropical climate, it shows you can do it just about anywhere. And we're already producing in tomatoes, over 30 varieties, leafy greens, over six varieties, and strawberries, over six varieties, and now expanding into new crops as we expand into other markets. And I wanted to mention on the team, we've assembled a, a very strong group of people to do this, but I put stars by all of the people that had training or development in Holland, right? This is really a cross-pollination of other technology disciplines, business builders, capitalists, industrial and energy specialists, and the, the miracle of Holland and its talents, right? And I believe that's what's needed to adapt this solution to a global market and its needs. This is what we've accomplished, right? On the, we built a pilot farm raised a, a lot of capital. We've now raised uh, in total over $216 million, and we're building out into multiple markets around the GCC and now expanding into Southeast Asia. We're in discussions in many markets there. We see a huge opportunity to really, from here to Japan, build while a lot of other people are focused on the U.S. and other mar markets. But also, guys, we, we mentioned China. China's a huge exporter um, in, into the Southeast Asia with roughly half of the vegetables and a third of the fruits in the region. But that's not sustainable for these countries either, right, to be dependent on that country for their food needs. So I, we see a huge opportunity in local for local production anywhere, right? This is an image of our vision in progress, right? And I just took a sampling of the quality of the strawberries, the incredible varieties, tiger tomatoes, tomato on the vine that we're able to produce. Our leafy greens as, as they've begun production, spinaches and other products. And this was an image of construction to just show you the environments it's in. But this is a, a sampling of images to show you this is happening, right? That we're growing these hybrid uh, systems, which are sort of like a, a high-tech greenhouse in a vertical farm had a baby, and we're using it to conquer the extremes of this environment and build. And also look on the bottom left image. I want to point that out. This is one of the shelves of one of the premium retailers here in Dubai. And every image you see there is our product, right? So the fact that consumers are adopting this, the market is accepting it, and we are changing the face of food retail. Now we just want to do it in every major metropolitan market from here to, to you know, Seoul. Is that and all? we see a huge opportunity. Yeah. And then I think uh, in closing up, guys, I wanted to mention yeah. our vision is to target the markets that are within 3,000 miles of the equator. Right. Why? These are hot, humid markets that historically have been import dependent from other markets. And we now have developed the capability in partnership with Holland, with the development of our own climate systems and our own construction tech to really build a big opportunity there. And the final comment I wanted to make on this, guys, is people are keep asking, hey, if this is such a great idea, why are there so few players doing it? And my colleague at Food Ventures was mentioning this about needing the capability. This is really hard. And this is where Holland needs to partner, as, as um, our, our colleague from uh, NEA was saying. But you really have to build five companies and deal with one other factor 
to do this, right? First, you have to solve and understand the external environment and the non-market forces, governments, local content requirements, et cetera, et cetera. And once you've done that, you need to build five companies. You need to market, sell, and brand a product. That's a CPG company, consumer packaged goods. You need technology. You either got to buy it or build it and then integrate it and successfully operate it, right? You need, of course, agronomical science. You need growers who understand plants, the life sciences, the integrated pest management, et cetera, select seed selection, all of these skills and capabilities. You then, this is a manufacturing business, huge industrial scale operations with enterprise resource planning software and systems, just in time procurement, you're managing a perishable good, and it's very complex to manage that operation. And then last but not least, and this is lost on people, especially as they come to emerging markets, you're a real estate development company. You take dirt and convert it into huge industrial assets dealing with permitting, localization, procurement, interface risk, negotiation. It is a very complex thing to do. It's also why people can't just call the Dutch and, and buy some equipment and be in this business, right? It's extremely challenging. But I think there are companies and entrepreneurs up to that challenge, like we see in the colleagues at this table, uh, doing it in different parts of the world, and also, of course, ourselves as we tackle these new markets. But I think it's important to mention that, especially as we think about the role of Holland in this future world, uh, where, where countries and companies wish to localize capability and participate in a bigger piece of the value chain and, and the value creation that's captured by localizing and making more sustainable fresh produce. Thank you, Sky. We'll uh, come back to you in a moment, and Edith, uh, Anita sorry, is going to have a lot of comments on that, I'm sure. I'd like to ask both of you, and then we'll come to Matt as well, to think about one war story from uh, setting things up something that really, really hurt and how you solved it. Because growing tomatoes in the desert, as you've already said, was not easy. And to get to the, the level of success that you've got to now, Sky and Dirk, uh, I'm sure there were a few things on the, on the road which were not so easy. So I'll leave that with you to think about. Now we're going to come to Matt. Matt uh, Gosnell, you're with uh, App Harvest. Thank you very much. Let me slide that over if I may, sir. Um, App Harvest, uh, wonderful story. We're going to hear more about that right now. And, uh, focus a little bit on the Americas. Yeah, thanks very much, Andrew. Very uh, honored to be here to speak on behalf of App Harvest with such a distinguished group. Thank you guys for, uh, for setting the table here. Um, hope we can load a presentation up here. There we go. Uh, so first uh, slide I wanted to show you guys, if it'll come. There we go. Dawn over the greenhouse here. This is Moorhead, Kentucky. This is uh, eastern Kentucky at the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains. App Harvest is Appalachian Harvest. Uh, a little play on words with, with the apps for the phone, but uh, it is Appalachian Harvest. Uh, so this is a 24-hectare, 60-acre, under-one-roof structure enabled by Dutch technology uh, in eastern Kentucky. So a uh, huge investment, part of the almost $200 million that we have so far uh, invested using Dutch technology, 150 million more on, on deck, probably another three to 400 behind that. So we are going to be expanding uh, and it's Dutch technology that's gonna enable that. So, uh, you know, we're seeing these big picture trends. I think we're all, you know, familiar with, with what's going on, but uh, specific to the US, the market demand is a very interesting piece. Our, our Food and Drug Administration says that only one in 10 Americans gets enough fruits and vegetables. If we can make that two in 10, we've doubled the market. So we think that the younger generation is driving a, a push for more healthy fruits and vegetables, as has been said, more locally sourced, uh, grown closer to home. We're also seeing a lot of uh, big money players come into this sector. We've seen uh, Equilibrium Capital raise over a billion dollars for a controlled environment equity fund. This is a, a West Coast based private equity firm. Uh, of course, the climate challenges that are, that are becoming worse and worse, it seems like every year. Uh, and, and what's going to enable this is going to be the continued march of technology uh, to grow at scale. And that's what's really needed in the U.S. Uh, you know, further, a, a couple other things we're seeing, you know, we, we obviously all lived through the, the, the COVID days and, and saw the unreliability of food systems. Just when you talk about the tomato market, two-thirds of that market in the U.S. comes from Mexico. This is the market share we're going after that we're trying to displace. Uh, so our unique strategic position in Kentucky, a, a centrally located Midwestern towards the East Coast state, allows us to get to 70% of the country within a day's drive. So we're you know, closing down logistics costs, less diesel, uh, and, and getting something to you within a day or two of it being picked. And that location was a conscious decision? 
It yeah. wasn't just because you guys happened to be located there? Absolutely. So we, just, we, just like Sky? That's right. We, we all actually, um, you know, some of us were, were from Kentucky originally. We had left the state, came back for this project. It it's good, makes good business sense. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about that okay. in just a second. But just a couple of things here. The, the uh, soil degradation we see a lot in the Midwest of the United States leads to a lot of second, third order effects. I don't know if you've heard about this red tide scenario in the Gulf of Mexico, but it's caused by pesticides and chemicals from Midwestern farms. And after the snow melts, those pesticides make their way into streams, into the Mississippi River, and then onto the Gulf. Eutrophication. Uh, this is a huge problem. So, of course, the way we're, we're building based on, you know, the Dutch technology allows us to keep that soil sequestered. Uh, and then, of course, water use. Uh, my friend Sky on the West Coast and uh, in Arizona and, and California, I mean, California specifically, 41 of 58 counties currently under extreme drought emergency conditions. This, this is not getting better year over year. And if you look at statistics of how much of, for example, leafy greens, I think it's something like 70% of the market in the United States for leafy greens is in California and Arizona, parts of the country that are drying up. So, uh, it, you know, we need to be expanding our ability to grow beyond, uh, you know, the, the West Coast traditional areas. So uh, we all see tremendous opportunity in this sector, um, and I, I certainly won't read all this, but, but what we need to do is help big finance understand the potential for this. You know, they're, they're used to dealing with row crop farmers. They're not as used in the United States to dealing with controlled environment farmers. So we need to make this business look more like a utility to them, which means predictable returns. So that, that is where you know, the Dutch technology, the Dutch uh, grow systems, uh, can allow a, a finance institution visibility into that. Um, so just a little bit about us here. Um, you know, we are a developer. We are a, a grower operator at big glass houses. Uh, as you saw, our first facility in, in Moorhead, Kentucky, we have three more uh, that are under construction that will be operational next year, another four or five behind that in the pipeline. Uh, we said we're going to build 12 of these facilities by 2025, so we're going to push beyond Appalachia, but we're very excited to have had this regional focus. We've got, that's allowed us to really get our feet on the ground uh, very quickly in an area of the country that doesn't have a lot of uh, investment coming in. Um, just in tomatoes alone, we've heard that we need 20,000 acres of tomato growth just to displace the market from south of the border. So if you talk about just one crop that we're currently growing, uh, the opportunity is tremendous. The demand is there. Our strategic partnership with Master Nardi gives us supply chain visibility that a lot of other controlled environment companies in the United States do not have. Um, so just a little bit more about this, Andrew. You mentioned our, our, our um, unique location here. So there's Kentucky, very centrally located, as you see. And, and uh, what maybe many in the audience don't know is that many large uh, international logistics companies have either headquartered, have their air hubs in Kentucky for the same reason that we do. You can get to so much of the country so, so quickly. So DHL, FedEx, uh, Amazon, UPS among them. Um, we recently reorganized ourselves as a holding company. So we have a couple of wholly owned subsidiaries that will allow us to realize value beyond our, our traditional area of, of Appalachia. We're very proud to have started in Appalachia, a region associated with extractive industry, timber, minerals, mining. A lot of these jobs have gone away. We're hiring exclusively local. This is another very unique thing we do, uh, hiring local as opposed to the temporary guest workers, which all of Midwestern agriculture utilizes, but uh, that, that, there is value outside of Appalachia, of course, and so our, our farm co-expansion, another uh, joint venture partnership with Master Nardi will allow us to expand beyond Appalachia. We've also uh, set up another entity called uh, a Techco. We acquired a robotics firm from Boston this winter called Root AI. Very excited to uh, integrate their tech stack into our, uh, into our facility. So we're talking about controls, we're talking about packing equipment, uh, ERP systems, robots, AI, data management. Um, they're doing a whole lot. They're some really smart guys, and, and I'm honored to be working with them. So, uh, you know, wrapping up here, we, we see a total addressable market in the U.S. of $320 billion. We think in Kentucky it's $10 billion alone. We tell this to our, our folks in the Capitol all the time, but we're, we're having conversations in D.C. We're having conversations in our state capital. We're getting phone calls from all around the world, all around the country, that are excited about this type of growing, uh, and excited about this type of technology. Uh, and it's entirely enabled by uh, what, what the Dutch ecosystem has, has shown. So uh, we're excited to try to replicate that in Kentucky and uh, continue to, to push out using uh, a lot of hands from, from Holland.
Matt, thank you so much for that. There's some great points to come to. Annette, I'm going to ask you to think about the economic development that Matt was suggesting as well in a region that does not, you know, is not missing uh, economic investments and jobs, etc. Very happy, I think, to have you guys set up there and doing a lot of great work there, jobs, and also the, uh, yeah, the dependency issue, both on workers as well as food imports. It'll be interesting to touch on that in a moment. But I did ask you for a war story, and I'm going to go, if I can, Sky, to you first. And uh, tell us from, you know, recent past, something which really struck you where you had a real, yeah, pain to try and work through and how you solved it. We have a lot of those, and especially being sort of uh, far away, um, often we need rely on support and capability from external markets, including Holland. But one area where COVID hit us was less so in the movement of goods and things. In fact, our local for local production was extremely compelling at a time when, uh, you know, people forget that the humans subsidize the food in the belly of the plane, right? And when there's no humans in planes, air freight becomes wildly expensive, especially for a perishable good. So that was wonderful. I, but what really hit us was moving people. Um, in fact, even within the United Arab Emirates, there was kind of a border between Abu Dhabi and Dubai. People forget, well, it's united. It is multiple states, right? And getting humans from Dubai to Abu Dhabi was a, a real challenge. For example, we, we hired a ton of our what we call agritechs. These are our technicians, our, our direct labor force within the uh, uh, high-tech greenhouses. And we got a bunch of them trapped in Dubai and couldn't get them into Abu Dhabi, yet we had plants coming and we were, we were going to be planting a greenhouse. Um, so it was a real challenge, but luckily we had good relationships within the leadership. The country helped us to solve this quickly because it's a very important project and very important initiative and, and it was good and right. But man, was it scary. We had people locked in Dubai, uh, staying in hotels and were unable to get them into the greenhouse where the plants needed them because they were arriving. Uh, we had air freighted in seedlings. And that's an example of a challenge. We were they're hit by really with COVID and the protocols of protecting across borders but just feeling also the, the challenges of this international, both so, uh, supply chain, for instance, for the seedlings, but also international sourcing of labor as we were developing this domestic capability, right? That, that's that been a challenge for us. It's hit us also in Kuwait, uh, struggles getting into the country, uh, but, but this is an example of a war story that we've faced. Excellent, and it's more or less solved now, things are moving more freely? One of the wonderful things about this reach, and they, they see the potential here, and there's a Minister of State of Future Food Security in the UAE, Her Excellency Mary Mohamari, who's come to Holland many times, and she helped us to get in uh, contact with the Ministry of uh, uh, Emiratization and Human Resources. That ministry removed these barriers within days and supported us. Now, we had to do all the right things, get our people tested, do all the things you needed to do, but really they, they cleared up that red tape very quickly. It just took us about three, five days to solve and we got all these over 40 people into, into Abu Dhabi to be able to man our farm or resource our farm and, and be able to hit our timelines and produce. In fact, we were planting in late April. We began harvesting in June, and we were harvesting straight from June until, uh, right, until now, right? Incredible output right through the peak of summer. But all of that would have been lost and not possible if we couldn't solve this challenge because we had no people and a lot of plants ready to be planted. So a lot of sleepless nights, but uh, all go now. Well done. And Miriam was a, a, our keynote speaker as well at the last Green Tech here, so we know her, know her very well. Good. Dirk, I'm sure you have a, a number of war stories, and it might be China, it might be Kazakhstan, it might be somewhere else. Tell us something. Yeah, we had, we had uh, quite a few <laughs> of them, and uh, I think if you Google, uh, you'll, you'll find quite, quite some interesting ones. We, we survived uh, difficult circumstances. Uh, because we were both in the preparation stage and construction and operations, but um, just when you when you when you were questioning uh, or setting this question, I was thinking about one moment that we talking about harsh climates. I mean, um, Kazakhstan basically has uh, a plus 40 in in summer and a minus 40 in winter. So you only have basically six months where you can construct. Uh, and that means the moment you start, you know exactly the moment you have to finish because mid-October, the, the, the temperatures are dropping. So I can remember we were still installing the, um, the boiler, which was crucial, of course, <laughs> before winter. And it was, uh, it was uh, around the 1st of November. So temperatures were already going down to minus 10 and you saw the minus 40 coming. And you know, for one thing, if you don't install it in time, then uh, the whole greenhouse is going to collapse under the pressure of snow. 
So we had to do so using the, um, the team from, uh, a, a team from Ukraine, which we had experience with working already on, on different, uh, different projects. There was absolutely some, uh, some sleepless, uh, sleepless nights uh, indeed, and we managed it uh, in time. And COVID in general, I mean, um, that was a challenge with which nobody saw coming, of course. Um, before COVID, we already started in, into uh, developing ourselves in monitoring based on data. So not on the, the finger spitze from, from a grower or not uh, his, his gut, feeling. gut feelings, yeah. but uh, transforming that gut feelings into data. Uh, that has been uh, obviously uh, accelerated in the last two years. So we're developing uh, tools uh, supporting that growers not, uh, so they don't have to every time walk through the crops and see every plant by itself, but using the tools so that offline uh, or online, our, our um, uh, expertise center in the Netherlands can support the grower on the ground and say, hey, you don't have to go through the whole greenhouse, just go to bay 25 in the middle because something seems to be off there and uh, that makes us much more effective. So yeah, we've been investing uh, in those last two years in making it uh, yeah, more um, supportive to the grower on the ground and less, less depending on the visits, the physical visits uh, on the project. Fantastic, thank you. Matt, I'm going to come to you in a moment, but let me uh, go back to the question I asked of Annetta about economic development, especially in regions that you might not anticipate, uh, because it seems that with this value proposition, basically you can be obviously in the middle of Kazakhstan, where the environment is not particularly uh, easy, um, but you, you become independent of certain factors. Um, so what does that mean in terms of your mission and mandate as well for economic development? Okay, yes, but what we can see is that the challenge is rather always different in every region. So you have to adapt to harsh climates or you have to work with a different kind of partners. Uh, yesterday in Wartime Stories, I spoke an entrepreneur who has been um, expanding rather rapidly but not brought his brand um, protection uh, really up to order to that. And then he was copied totally. So even with his, his movie, he was in it, but it was the movie of a Chinese company selling a Chinese product that looked very similar and was actually also stating made from the Holland, you know? Right. So th this kind of stories you hear a lot. So you always have to look carefully into your environment and where you want to have this, uh, these solutions. And uh, of course, we have a lot of transition problems now with, uh, with transport, et cetera, and we have transport security, and we are, we are trying to, to help companies with that. But actually, in the long run, I think um, we are supporting um, with instruments that can be adapted locally. So the Partners for Business is uh, adapted to the local situation in where this cluster is going. Uh, it's branding, but it's also fairs or what you need. We are supporting this uh, centers of expertise or knowledge and innovation centers or integrated centers. And it's every time it's a little bit different. Uh, the demonstration facility can be used on your local situation, the market studies, the fairs. It's, we are trying to adapt it to the local situations or the regions uh, where you work in because the problems are different. Uh, the challenges are more or less the same, but the way you are going to handle it and yep. provide with uh, solutions are different. Well, we're going to hear, if you uh, are here at 12.45 Netherlands time, um, a wonderful case study, actually in Germany, so just over the border, not far yeah. away, uh, a region in the east which um, has been a coal mining area for a long, long time. There are 40,000 jobs basically at stake, but it's transitioning completely to renewable, yeah. and having a lot of production around the Lausitz, the Lausitz area. And uh, the thoughts and the first planning phases are in place already to put a lot of horticulture into that area to use as well the renewable energies, also to stabilize the grid. And um, it's a very inspiring uh, story. So um, also for economic development in that region, very important. So uh, Matt, you did touch on that uh, issue and it's very, very interesting to hear that. Um, but maybe you have a different war story about getting set up. I'm sure you could entertain us all sure. day with war stories. Well, we, uh, we set up our first facility during, during COVID. We, uh, we were deemed critical infrastructure at the state and national level early on, so allowed us to continue construction activities. We, we never had 
uh, a break in, in our construction there. So we went from first shovel in the ground to operational in 18 months. So uh, we're very proud of, of our, our development process and, and the schedule that we put into place and, and of course all enabled by our friends at Dalsum uh, here locally. So uh, you know we had great partnerships there. We're excited to work with future builders uh, in the future. Um, you know there's a lot of challenges though with setting up something like this in Kentucky and in the United States. You know the, the sector is very well established here. We're all familiar with 10,000 plus supporting businesses uh, that support this industry. We need a couple dozen of these or more to come to the United States. We, we've invested in, in Holland. We want Holland to invest in us. Uh, this is, and don't do it because you like us or, you know, because uh, we're asking you nicely. Do it because the market is there. As I say, one in ten Americans eat enough fresh fruits and vegetables. The expansion opportunity is tremendous. The upside is tremendous. But we need labor. We need materials in the United States closer to home. That's preventing us from scaling as fast as we want. Uh, our lack of ability to scale means that there's a higher cost of capital still. So all these problems are circular and connected, uh, and we need to make these connections and, and continue the education process with policymakers, uh, with, with, with the politicians back home, um, and folks like Aneta who, who can coordinate with, with local folks here in, uh, in Holland and talk about how to support this industry, supplier industries to come, come behind us, because we're going to have multiple of these operational continue to grow in the future. So we need, we need your help. Good. I see Sky nodding his head. I think he's yes. facing very similar challenges. So I'm sure you guys can exchange uh, a lot of experience there. I'm going to ask you then, gentlemen, in a moment to tell me what's next. But firstly, uh, Aneta, you've heard some of these stories. Just one thing that actually um, Matt touched on was the red tide and eutrophication. And of course, the Dutch are quite well known as well for water. Yeah. And uh, it's dealing with similar problems, basically, you know, the, the nitrates and the excessive minerals in, in the water causing problems. So I'm sure that as well is something that um, the enterprise agency can help with, not only for horticulture, but also in, in water. But how would that kind of collaboration and, and helping out with situations in other parts of the world work from a Dutch perspective? You have colleagues who look after water, and I'm sure you talk. Yes, of course we talk. Um, actually, um, it, it's uh, sustainability uh, besides innovation and agriculture and international are the four pillars of the Netherlands Enterprise Agency. And uh, my colleagues are working quite hard to stimulate programs that uh, help to solve water quality issues or uh, abundance of water or lack of water everywhere in the world. And we are trying to combine these kind of programs to also to help to build a, a whole proposition. So we have also different kinds of program uh, to, to help with these water challenges. Uh, but you can also see in the Middle East that we are developing a combined proposition in water energy and horticulture. And we also see already a cluster of partners working in this combined transition. Uh, in Jordania, it's the same. It's also lack of water in combination with food. and we trying to tackle that together because that's what the societal challenges is asking. So actually we are trying to support uh, this cross-border kind of operation. Fantastic and water challenges you all, you all face as well. But let's now ask to finalize really our session now in sort of 30 seconds. What's next, Matt? Sure, well, you know, the, on the water piece, of course, we're, we're utilizing 100% recycled rainwater and, and a net zero water facility. So, Annette, I'm sure you're you know, excited to, that you guys are contributing to that as well. But we're going to continue to grow, Andrew. I mean, we, like I say, we have three more of these projects under, under construction right now, multiple behind us. But, uh, but we need new partners. We need new collaborative uh, experiences. Uh, we need to educate more. Uh, we need to be able to attract more growers from, from further than just, you know, Europe and Latin America. We need to home grow them. So we're, we're instituting programs at the high school level. We're using shipping container greenhouses as a mobile classroom, essentially, deployed in six high schools in Kentucky right now. Um, you know, these, these are no, not revenue generating for us, but uh, exciting to get that next generation, uh, you know, to, to see that they can use applied technology for food. This is not their father and grandfather's uh, open field agriculture. So. We're pushing out in a lot of ways, and uh, you know we're really excited about the future. Very optimistic about where things are headed. Fantastic, Sky. Very quickly, what's next? Yeah, I would say we're clearly overcoming the same challenges. We're developing growers, for instance, from the. We have an Emirati grower uh, who's a female who's won some awards and a fantastic addition to our team. 
Iranian, uh, a grower from Mexico moved here. We're having to source talent and develop them around the world, but we're on a growth plan, right? We've, we're harnessing the fact that we have a very real first mover advantage in these extreme environments, leveraging the data to improve our technology and our systems, further automate the climate system as well. And then we, we have a pipeline of nearly 100 hectares of projects, and we're being, we get two to three inbound inquiries a week of projects, which we're very keen to, to engage, so please keep sending them. But of course, we can't execute them all immediately. But you'll see a lot out of us on the capital front, like our friends at App Harvest. This is a, a utility, right? It's a capital intensive industry. So we got to spend money to make money and to, and to make an impact. And so the other thing I think you'll see is, uh, much as uh, Matt said, a call to, to the Dutch technology cohort to, to join us, right? Invest in us as we're investing in you. Build that presence and capability in the markets we're in. Help us to scale. Uh, also, if you don't do it for us, do it in your own self-interest because the countries that we're entering will, all, if they haven't already, they will impose domestic content requirements and other things. Let's accept that reality and work together to, to scale more quickly and really deliver this solution to the world. It's how we'll make an impact and, and really feed all of these people with great high quality food. And it's also how we'll, we'll be able to make sure that Holland participates in the value it's created with this miracle. Sky, shokran. Dirk, next. Yes, uh, so I think for over the last 10 years, we've been um, uh, proving uh, the team and the tools to work uh, abroad in, in new projects. The, the two projects that we have, um, we want to expand. So, so China is going to be uh, up to 50 hectares and in uh, Kazakhstan we're uh, enlarging from the existing 10 to 20 and then using that blueprint to build another uh, three times 20 hectares in, uh, in Kazakhstan. Uh, in the coming months, uh, we're announcing uh, the new regions where we're, where we're going to. Um, I'll be in the Saudi uh, next month and uh, in the month after in the U.S. So I um, uh, hope to follow up this, uh, this meeting uh, um, uh, with the people here on the table as well and uh, keen on uh, announcing the new regions. Annette, it strikes me that for such an old industry, there's so much dynamism, so much change, so much excitement, so much growth, so much things going on. Yes, it's true. And actually, as a public network, uh, regionally, nationally, but also with our agriculture and trade offices all over the world, we hope uh, that tomorrow everyone is ringing us and uh, we can build on it uh, because there's a lot of enthusiasm and we have a very good uh, position already, but uh, we can do a lot more in uh, solving the global challenges. And we will. Annette, with that, gentlemen, a big round of applause, please, for the guests here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, And I did mention before that we had this wonderful case study uh, from the Lausitz in, uh, in Germany, uh, great collaboration there, and we're going to be covering that in 45 minutes here at the Vision Stage. So thank you very much, and uh, please visit the exhibition. Okay, thank you.